So um, let's start with old business. Uh, so in a, in a nutshell, great traction uh, of community contributions over the past month, approximately. I'm just going to mention three of the tickets that have been most active, but there's actually a bunch more. So uh, kudos for those of you uh, in the community helping, supporting, and adding value. Uh, thank you very much, and please keep doing so. First one I'll bring up is uh, this contribution from Dirk, uh, who I spoke with a while ago. So Dirk is supporting um, the Steel Image Proc um, part of the Image Proc package, which is uh, probably one of the most relevant packages in the perception stack of ROS. And he is bringing it to, um, I believe, HLS using Vitis, um, so AMD's technology, uh, and he's doing that himself. Uh, there is a, an already available uh, implementation of, of the monocular version of uh, the stereo, uh, sorry, the image proc part of it, but he is porting things to uh, image proc stereo, which is uh, an awesome contribution. And things like this are definitely what's going to get us uh, faster into more and more use cases and, and into speeding up our computational graph. So thank you, Dirk, and uh, keep an eye on this project if, if you're interested. Uh, the second one is uh, this project, uh, which is being led by uh, Sied. So he's uh, he's actually uh, working on uh, porting and bringing up to speed uh, in an FPGA, according to what he's saying, um, the org slam to uh, ROS to uh, node and, and pieces uh, of code, actually. So he's doing, uh, I think, pretty uh, interesting work in the background. Uh, I gave him some pointers, and now he's provided a full description of how to create your own platform. Uh, by this platform, which is uh, not the easiest piece uh, to do, and definitely deserves maybe additional uh, documentation and walkthroughs. He's done a fantastic job providing his recipe, and uh, and thumbs up to him, and and definitely uh, worth checking if if this is something you guys are are uh, working with. The third one is the um, Ultra 96 Progress, uh, which I'm hoping uh, to hear uh, some of you, particularly uh, Joe. I think. Um, you may have some interesting comments. So I thought that Pedro was um, out of the game for a while. At least that's what I got from him. But apparently he's uh, he's now back uh, in the game and he's he's got some uh, cycles, apparently. As far as I know, Pedro uh, did build a preliminary uh, firmware layer. And um, I have not had the chance to test it fully, to be very honest. I've been occupied with other matters, but uh, it sounded last time we spoke that there's a push needed to generate the firmware artifacts and the conversation is long. I've provided lots of input about how to do it. Happy to continue doing it if needed. Um, it sounded like uh, some of you may have some cycles to contribute on this and get uh, the Ultra 96 V2 as a first class participant of the uh, hardware architecture we've been putting together. Um, so that's awesome. Joe, uh, do you have any comments about this? Um, so I went through the I went through the rep last night. I combed through this issue, and I think what I'm going to try to do is just get to a spot where um, is it Pedro? Who who is the other person that was working this? The at Pedro. PI Martos Pedro. Yeah, Pedro. I'm going to try to get to I'm going to try to recreate what he's already done um, and see if that uh, update to 2021.2 fixes that last bug that he caught. Um, but I'm going to dig into that this weekend. So I'll we'll hope to have some updated status at the next meeting. Cool, cool, fantastic. And and also to try to maybe group together um, joint efforts. So so I created um, acceleration firmware Ultra 96, here it is. So I created this repo um, for Pedro a while ago. And I think he's he hasn't made a release just yet. So that's one thing he should consider. Um, uh, he actually, sorry, uh, there's a release in here, which is a draft. I, I, I didn't see that. OK, so maybe this is something to check. Uh, but regardless, uh, I gave Pedro access to this. What I'll do, Joe, is if you can uh, pass to me your uh, GitHub handle, what I'll do is I'll give you privileges so that you can also uh, interact with this. And someone else, which I think um, might be uh, interested in maybe adding his bits and experiences, Jorge. Uh, Jorge, I believe that you also have tinkered a bit with the Ultra 96 V2, right? I think I've read some walkthrough and instructions from your side, uh, putting it up to speed with, I don't know if it was Foxy or, or Rollin. Uh, yes, I was using Galactic uh, or Foxy. But yes, I can help you if you want, Joe. 
Cool, cool. Okay, so um, so that's awesome. And what I'll do is I'll mention you uh, as well, Jorge. And uh, I do have your uh, GitHub handle, so uh, so I'll keep that handy and, and also maybe add you. Okay, Joe. So just maybe paste that as a suggestion in the minutes, and I'll I'll make sure that that happens and we move this forward. I'm I'm excited to get this ongoing, and it would be fantastic to get the first community contributed uh, port. Uh, that would be that would be pretty cool. Awesome. Cool. So that was uh, with regard uh, some of the community contributions and traction uh, generated out of that. Um, I also wanted to mention the fact that uh, there's been good progress and we are on track for the integration uh, with Humble. As you may know, uh, the next big ROS release, uh, ROS2 release, sorry, is happening in May, uh, ROS Humble Huxby. And that's going to be uh, actually the first uh, release that's going to be maintained for five years. So it's going to be pretty relevant. Uh, many are going to build uh, both academia and across industry. Uh, so there's been an effort uh, from our side, from the hardware acceleration working group uh, side, to actually try to get that in alignment, uh, or at least get our work sorry, in alignment with uh, Humble. Uh, right now, we're pushing uh, most of the relevant packages, ROS packages, that put together the architecture of hardware acceleration to rolling so that when the fork happens, because Humble gets out of, of uh, uh, rolling as a fork, um, we're, we're essentially ready. Um, and so you can track uh, much of that in these two tickets. Um, the two contributions I wanted to highlight, the first one is the fact that I've, I've made some additions at the, um, at the Rep 2008, which for those of you uh, who are new to the group or haven't been uh, in past meetings, it's a, a joint effort to try to uh, somehow standardize and provide a reference architecture and conventions on how to do hardware acceleration in ROS2 in a vendor agnostic manner. We don't want to be, um, you know, siding with A or B. Uh, and and the, the intent is to try to be as fair as possible across vendors and also to encourage others to jump into uh, the architecture and, and bring their own boards and their own technologies. Um, I added these uh, contributions. You, you see them summarizing here. Uh, the first one is, is pretty silly, but the, the, the ones after, uh, including adding a methodology, which you can see described in this figure, are somewhat interesting. And I encourage you to, to check them out. They, they, they can be checked in here. There hasn't been lots of um, activity in this ticket recently, but I'm hoping for it to uh, warm up again because um, I'm happy, actually, this is something that we'll cover afterward, but I'm really, really happy to share that uh, I have disclosed uh, some work that I've done uh, on my on my side time, porting the architecture actually to some of the NVIDIA uh, boards. So uh, that was pretty cool. And actually I enjoyed pretty much uh, the, the journey and also working with Ross uh, Gems, with Isaac Ross Gems, sorry. Um, and uh, essentially uh, it all comes down to these three packages, which you can see over there. Um, it has limited capabilities at this stage, uh, frankly speaking, because I've been putting my, my side time on it. But uh, the overall blueprint and architecture uh, should be um, well defined enough to build upon uh, in future efforts and, and to build up additional capabilities. So, so pretty excited. Uh, with this, you can right now run various of the examples that are living in acceleration examples, which is one of the packages that we are maintaining. And yeah, together with, with those last contributions, I'm hoping to uh, to get this uh, landing finally into a, a formal uh, rep, ROS enhancement proposal. I uh, encourage you guys once again to uh, have a look. Uh, I, I think I heard that Joe uh, did, did take a look and, and, and Joe, feel free to dive and, and put your comments or ideas, uh, super open to, to, to additional bits. Um, and I would say the same for everyone. This is, a, I think it's a good read. Um, I don't want to say great, but it's it's definitely I've definitely put quite a bit of effort. Um, let me see if I have it handy in here. Um, yeah, so essentially the the sources itself you can see them in the file changes and in the contributions. Uh, but it's a it's a short document um, where we attempt to be pretty uh, clear uh, and and down to the point. Uh, so yeah, anyhow, have a read. I encourage you to do so and and send your input. Uh, and we keep up, of course, with the intention of merging first accelerators into official ROS2 stacks so that uh, just by pseudo IPT minus get whatever uh, ROS2 stack, you actually do get the accelerators or capabilities to actually build uh, accelerators from those resources. Uh, so far, the effort uh, in the past month has concentrated into the release processes of each one of those uh, core packages in the architecture of hardware acceleration into rolling so that, again, they get shipped into Humble. Uh, and that's happening uh, in the open. And uh, of course, you can you can follow the progress and uh, provide your input if needed. 
Um, on that, a quick actual comment. Uh, sorry, I haven't pushed this, but there's gonna be an update on the community repo uh, by essentially um, adding uh, more clarity at the sub project lists uh, so that we, we can segment also that down the road by core architectural uh, components, ROS packages, uh, and examples and tools to actually do hardware acceleration appropriately. But that's, that's landing. I just didn't have the time uh, to do it today, but I'll, I'll do it maybe tonight or, or tomorrow. Okay, so that's it uh, for what concerns old business. Um, any comments, uh, points about old business? All right, so uh, new business and progress review. Um, exciting one. Um, Hardware accelerated ROS chip perception pipelines. Um, so I posted a link in this blog. Um, sorry, I, there's a link in here, and I posted this um, blog post a few days ago describing essentially some work that I've been doing, uh, not only uh, accelerating a perception pipeline, which I described in past meetings, but also comparing it uh, across uh, hardware acceleration solutions. Um, all of the uh, source code is actually fully available and disclosed, uh, which in my vision, at least. Uh, and it's been like that with all the architects I spoke with. Uh, it, it is a requirement for actually claiming benchmarking uh, in hardware architectures. So everything is open source. Uh, you can check it out. You can reproduce it. If you struggle reproducing it, uh, open a ticket, open an issue, uh, complain, uh, shout, and I'll do my best to support you. In principle, again, this has been tested, not just by myself, but also by others uh, in various teams, actually uh, within AMD and other groups increasingly so yeah in principle um this puts together as i explained in the past a very simple two node computational graph which is doing uh rectification and resizing and uh what i'm showing today uh to you all is actually a step forward comparing it across uh i think interesting uh and i would say leading uh solutions for hardware acceleration uh in particular we are comparing amd's uh krs the Korea robotics stack and nvidia's uh isaac ross gems which are also open source and 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 ready to be used. Um, and we are comparing that against the uh, ROS2 baseline, which stands for the default ROS2 perception stack. And we can see some interesting numbers in here. I will not get into uh, lots of details uh, for the sake of time, uh, but you can see how uh, you can see in a nutshell that there is some platforms that do better in this particular computational graph. Of course, I want to highlight this is computational graph specific. There might be other computational graphs where we might actually see a reverse situation where maybe GPUs actually outperform FPGAs. But for this particular case, and as far as my uh, benchmarking and, and strictly speaking, following the architecture we've been defining and the benchmarking uh, approach defined and methodology, uh, we actually get up to, or we get approximately an 8x, 8x improvement by using, um, in this case, an FPGA uh, versus using uh, GPUs. It's interesting actually um, how things land when you don't only use uh, the total runtime, uh, which is measured by using uh, LTTNG and instrumenting the whole perception pipeline, uh, but actually by um, adding to that the power uh, information, which you can fetch easily from both the Jetson and the Kriya boards. And if you compose that all together and generate uh, performance per watt plots, you get something like this, um, which, uh, which is significant, especially in robotics and especially in mobile robotics, because you definitely want to get performance with uh, low power consumption to ensure that the autonomy um, goes uh, goes as smooth as possible. So um, I just wanted to uh, show this and open up the mic for others to to comment and and share ideas and thoughts. Particularly, uh, Gordon, I don't know if you have any comments about what could be done, what can I do, and what can others do to actually get the performance uh, on the uh, nano and on the uh, AGX um, to a higher uh, end when using uh, gems. Yeah, I think we'd have to dig into what was run and what hardware was run for it. Um, I'm not entirely surprised that the, you know, the performance might not be great because there's a lot of data movement that has to happen from CP to GPU and back, and that's super inefficient. And that's one of the things that we we have to fix with this working group. Yeah, 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 and agreed. And and on that, I, I must admit that actually the, the results with AMD's KRS are actually like that because we are using this uh, new concept which I introduced in the last uh, meeting, which I personally call super topic. Uh, but technically speaking, it's, it's an intra FPGA queue which leverages Axie 4 streaming interfaces. So this is leveraging FPGA specific uh, streaming interfaces for accelerating communication so that node to node actually 
interoperate throughout the FPGA and the information doesn't go back and forth uh, to the to the CPU, which is I think what Gordon was was pointing out. I'm I'm somewhat excited to uh, to test out I think what's coming soon uh, regarding the uh, optimizations of leveraging a type adaptation in BOSS 2. I don't know how optimistic I am though <laughs> to see like this uh, improving significantly, but um, I'm definitely up for uh, running this again. If you guys from NVIDIA have some hints on how this can can get better. I, frankly speaking, have used the, uh, I believe the official instructions you have provided using both uh, the root file systems provided as well as, uh, as the hardware. I didn't modify uh, the hardware ports, but uh, yeah, this, this is something we should revisit and definitely something that the working group is tackling and should tackle uh, very well said on that. So. Yeah, uh, so here you have a few more uh, notes about what I just explained, the super topics. Um, and also you have a discussion around how su super topics are not just great because they optimize the ROS2 message passing infrastructure um, and overhead, but also they are great because uh, there are two approaches here, specifically um, specifically for FPGAs, but they, they may this may also apply to other like architectures, including GPUs. One is to completely re-architect your computational graph, smashing all of the source code together and then defining the kernels as most appropriate. That's kind of like the approach that I've been told many have been following in industry for quite a while, many using GPUs and many using FPGAs for robotic applications. And that's also what I've seen uh, in this last year involved in robotic use cases. Uh, with with a big semiconductors company, uh, but uh, frankly speaking, that has a huge overhead for the systems architect. Uh, so uh, what Supertopics introduce actually is complete transparency and alignment with ROS2 uh, default APIs. You don't need to modify actually anything. All of the complexity is handled directly by these XC4 streaming interfaces, and you don't need to re-architect anything. So that's pretty cool. It comes with an overhead. It does slightly worse than re-architecting everything. You can see that re-architecting everything gets you uh, mean-wise at least uh, a bit uh, better and it gets you uh, with, a, with a more generous um, speed up overall. However, I think it is definitely uh, worth the uh, overhead because um, it essentially uh, speeds up significantly also the development process by not having to modify anything in your computational graph. Um, I must say, though, that the current implementation of super topics is very limited. So a uh, word of advice in there. Uh, currently, um, that it's just a first prototype which can evolve and will evolve as interest is shown and as funding is thrown into it. Um, and right now, it's just prepared to do single producer, single consumer interaction. So if you actually have various topics or various nodes subscribing to the same topic and expect the super topic to comply with that, you actually would need to, uh, in hardware, make some modifications, such as duplicating the streams and so on and so forth. This is something that doesn't come right away. It's definitely doable, and uh, I'm more than happy to help comply with those use cases uh, one by one. And frankly speaking, that's also uh, one thing that I'm hoping to do uh, increasingly, um, because as some of you uh, know, uh, I'm essentially uh, going to step aside from AMD and I'm going a bit more independent, which is going to help me also drive the working group uh, better, hopefully to be more uh, fair towards everyone and overall also to try to uh, optimize the, uh, I would say, experience of users, which is at the end of the day what uh, a working group in the ROS2 community should be doing. So um, yeah, that was, um, that was it with uh, regard the, uh, I think, exciting uh, results on um, accelerating perception pipelines uh, with ROS2. And there's two more topics I'd like to cover uh, today before we listen to uh, the guest talk. Uh, the first one is the uh, workshop. So I am organizing a workshop in the upcoming ROSCon, which is happening in Kyoto um, in October. Um, and I'd be delighted to, of course, have some of you, uh, I don't think all of you uh, will be able to present, but at least some of you presenting if you want, if you will, and if you wish. Um, I have a long list of contributors, many of which I think you've met, uh, which have attended to past working group meetings as guests, uh, similar to Hong Young th this time. And uh, I'm definitely um, up for pulling from that list. And some of them have actually shown a proactive interest on in participating. But before that, I just wanted to make sure to uh, count with everyone that's uh, attending uh, these meetings uh, in case they have um, something to share and, and, and they plan to be in Kyoto because this is gonna be an in-person event. And that's also what I'm, what I'm rooting for and what I'm pushing for. I'll be there for sure, uh, unless physically it's impossible. But 
Uh, I, I definitely plan to be there. Uh, a word of advice is I'm particularly looking for these three topics. Okay, these are the three topics I'm, I'm interested to hear about proposals. And so there's a ticket um, in here, uh, which you can track and which is actually going to evolve in the coming weeks. Um, eventually all of it will land into a Google Docs and that's what will be used to ship uh, the formal proposal for the workshop. But um, if any of you have some ideas or would like to make a presentation in the workshop, uh, please comment in here or reach out to me. Um, and can, I, if you don't... can I make uh, one point uh, for people thinking about attending? Um, I believe that Roscon precedes IROS each year. So this is a great opportunity to double dip with one of the best uh, academic conferences in robotics as well. So um, I plan on attending. And I think that if, if you have interest in the working group, it would be great to go and attend IROS as well. Well, well said, well said. Yeah, and plus one for that. That's, that's totally correct. As far as I know, and it's been more than, I think, eight years, nine years for me attending ROSCON. So, <laughs> so quite a while. Yeah, uh, it typically tags uh, along IROS. And if you haven't been in IROS, it's a fantastic venue, uh, more academic, but uh, there is uh, lots of industry uh, representation in there as well. So I uh, definitely encourage you guys to, to be there. ROSCON this year is gonna be awesome. Uh, so um, you should definitely come if you're interested in, in these topics. Cool. Um, all right, so I want uh, still much uh, more time for this topic, but I, uh, I will be pinging some uh, people to ask for, um, proactively for their participation. If they want, again, it's totally up to you. Uh, my objective is to put together um, at least between four and eight talks um, that hopefully is gonna put um, uh, a timeline of about four hours approximately. Uh, I'm gonna try to get representation from as many uh, actual uh, vendors as possible. So uh, I would love to get like them uh, right in there. But besides that, as I said, uh, I'm, I'm definitely very interested in getting uh, people uh, to speak about use cases, demanding hardware acceleration. I think that's gonna be very uh, interesting. And also about new computer architectures uh, in robotics. It, it actually, I'm, I'm even willing to consider things not using ROS2 in there, uh, but, but we'll see what comes. All right, and last topic before we hand it to uh, the guest talk is the robotic processing unit. This is a new project uh, that we are kicking officially uh, as a sub project supported by the uh, ROS2 Hardware Acceleration Working Group. Um, for today, I'll just say a few words about the project, but this is something that's gonna formalize over upcoming meetings and which you will see us and, and me speaking a lot about it. Um, for now, I'll just say that uh, the actual target and definition uh, that we are going to adopt, unless someone suggests something better, which I'm totally open to, is that uh, the RPUs or, or robotic processing units are going to be robot-specific processors to map ROS computational graphs efficiently to underlying compute uh, resources, including all possible compute substrates, but the most important ones are, are mentioned in here, to, of course, obtain best performance in the ROS2 computational graphs. Uh, some of you might be thinking that RPU is a horrible acronym because it's real-time uh, sorry, real-time processing unit or it's a radio processing unit. Um, I've, I've gotten already those complaints, uh, and if you do have them, please do suggest something better. That would be my, my, my mention. Uh, right now, I'm not too um, pushy on the uh, acronym itself. Actually, uh, I, I don't really care at this point. Um, and if we can come up as a group with something better, then cool. Uh, I think what, what I do care about is to, getting, to get this project uh, ongoing. The vision itself is actually to try to um, get together architectures uh, that lead to uh, improved performance in the usual robotic tasks, particularly sensing, perception, mapping, localization, motion control, low level control and actuation. That's kind of like the, uh, those are the actual targets. And we will try to tackle those by various use cases. Some use cases may tackle one or multiple of these, uh, but that's essentially uh, the objective. One uh, aspect to consider is that the objective is not at least it's not initially, uh, and we'll see what happens down the road, but uh, the initial objective is not to design a new physical device or new hardware. That's not the objective. The objective is to exist, to use, sorry, existing off the shelf hardware acceleration development platforms, uh, to put them together, maybe to compose um, essentially boards from different vendors as, as the overall robotic processing unit, and then to ship uh, or to use, sorry, 
uh, each one as appropriate to accelerate the part that's more convenient from a ROS to computational uh, perspective. Um, that is going to be uh, the goal. Uh, at this stage, um, the announcement of the project has been made. I'm receiving some interest already, so thank you all of those of you who are showing interest. There's a forum in here, uh, and it's also publicly available elsewhere, where you can show interest. You can actually throw some ideas, and I very much appreciate if you can do it, because it's, it's uh, going to be considered. I promise that. Uh, my next step and our next step uh, would be uh, to try to define use cases that will drive the development of the robotic processing unit. I'd like this project to be, to be driven by essentially use cases that allow us iteratively to benchmark, to know exactly what we are improving, how we are improving it, and to land into the right architecture. Maybe, you know, this right architecture ends up being using, you know, FPGAs for I.O., uh, and then GPUs for the rest, or maybe not. Maybe actually we use all, only GPUs or only FPGAs, we'll see. Uh, but definitely um, driving things through use cases and particularly through acceleration examples is going to help us keep a very um, essentially, um, well, benchmarking oriented uh, and quantitative uh, approach, which I personally like very much. And as you can guess, I'm a big fan of, of, of the book uh, of Robot computer architecture, uh, quantitative approach. Um, and uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, once the use cases are defined, which hopefully uh, should be done maybe in, in, if not by next meeting, in a, in a few meetings, uh, we'll start partitioning the work and aiming towards uh, fulfilling those use cases through demonstrators. And we'll see how the partition happens and who can put time in, in what. And that's also why it's important for you to show interest and to show um, will. Um, I'll mention this a few times in the future as well. Uh, the project is uh, going, going to be constantly open for sponsorships and collaborations. I think this is super important to ensure the, uh, the fact that the project continues. Otherwise, it will just die if we just pull uh, like free cycles from, from me or from someone else. Uh, so that's also something to consider. And if there's any organization out there uh, with interest, uh, please reach out and we'll find a way that uh, you get represented uh, or that you can contribute while, while also getting something uh, in exchange. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, I personally am very excited about this project and I know many people out there is as well. So uh, expect uh, good updates regarding this. All right, so um, what we'll do now, unless anyone has a pressing question, is handed to uh, our guest speaker. And as always, we'll have the Q&A at the end of the session, uh, both about the first part of the meeting and the second part. All right, so Wan Yong, uh, the uh, stage is yours and uh, looking forward. Uh, thanks. Let me share my screen first. We can see, we can see the screen. Thank you. Okay, okay, I see. Uh, Okay, uh, first, uh, thank you for uh, inviting us to present our work. So my name is Hyunjong Choi, uh, and I'm a postdoc uh, at the University of California, Riverside. And I'm a member of Real-Time Embedded and Network System Laboratory. So if I introduce our lab just shortly, our lab actually focuses on real-time and embedded and cyber-physical system. Specifically, we aim to achieve safe and predictable and efficient computing under uncertain environment, which is critical area of uh, uh, research for the continued innovation and widespread usability of intelligent autonomous technology, including self-driving cars and smart uh, health or the agriculture system uh, and so on. So uh, today I will talk about our recent work, uh, priority-driven chain aware scheduling framework for ROS2. And this work is uh, done with my colleague, uh, Ye Cheng, and my uh, current advisor, Professor Hyosin Kim. And this work uh, originally was introduced at ITAS conference in uh, 2021, uh, which has a great venue in uh, real-time system research community. So uh, let's get started. Um, I think the audience today here are already very familiar with ROS, right? So uh, ROS, to, uh, ROS is a flexible framework for writing robot software and one of the most popular open sources in academia and industry. So uh, this figure was captured in February this year. Uh, as you can see, 
uh, the number of users of ROS is still increasing for uh, several different metrics uh, since it had been introduced in 2007. This is because as we already know, ROS has a strong software modularity and composability. So uh, it provides lots of software tools and libraries and best practices across a wide variety of robotic platforms. However, uh, over the decades, uh, the first version of ROS has exposed the limitation in real-time supports. Uh, then the question is why real-time capability is important for ROS framework. So here the left figure describes the architecture of uh, Autoware AI. Uh, Autoware AI is an all-in-one open source software for autonomous driving uh, that is built on ROS1. So on top of a ROS as a middleware, Autoware consists of an individual module in an application layer, such as the sensing and perception and planning and control. And those modules are connected with uh, data dependency and forms of processing chain. So here is a good uh, motivational example from an uh, autonomous vehicle. Uh, let's suppose a scenario that a vehicle tries to stop because it recognizes uh, an obstacle in front of it. Uh, generally, uh, the total stopping distance consists of two phases. First, at the time when a driver or a machine recognizes an obstacle and apply a break. Uh, I call it which is uh, the perception reaction uh, distance. Uh, the second phase is a deceleration from the initial speed of the vehicle after the brake starts to operate. And uh, this braking deceleration distance is typically determined by the initial speed and the dynamics on, and physics of the vehicle. So actually we cannot control it. However, in autonomous vehicle system, the perception reaction distance can be varied by the response time of the perception pipeline of the system. And such a pipeline is uh, composed of complex information flow in the form of a chain. Therefore, uh, guaranteeing timely execution of such a chain and improve its end-to-end -end latency is crucial to avoid catastrophic accidents, especially for safety critical applications. So in other words, the real-time support is very important for ROS framework. So uh, this motivates uh, the development of second generation of ROS in the community. So ROS2 has released its first long-term support version in 2017. And already uh, most concepts are inherited from the original ROS. Uh, ROS2 has uh, completely defected the original ROS framework. And moving from ROS1 to ROS2 has many benefits related to real-time capability quality of service and security. And as we know, ROS2 supports the DBS. Uh, however, uh, ROS2 still some limitation, especially in the real-time perspective. Uh, although ROS2 has somehow improved in real-time capability, it still has some limitation. And those issues are not trivial to tackle. Uh, first, uh, ROS2 default executor has a unique callback scheduling policy. Here, this figure uh, describes uh, the ROS2 default callback scheduling within an executor. Uh, basically, a timer callback is uh, always checked first and scheduled. It. Then it considers other types of callback. So uh, the executor uh, ignores the criticality or urgency of task change in callback scheduling. Uh, this behavior actually uh, raises some issues like the callbacks suffer from a priority inversion because a timer callback is always scheduled first. So in other words, it makes callback's priority ineffective. So as a result, the overall callback scheduling in ROS2 is like a uh, fairness-based scheduling, which means that it cannot prioritize safety critical chain when multiple chain exist in the system. Uh, second, in addition to that, uh, currently, ROS2 has no systematic resource allocation policy and does not define any property on chain. That means that there is no general guideline about how to allocate nodes to executors and how to assign executors priority and maps those executors to available CPU cores. So uh, improving end-to-end -end latency of chains for ROS2 is not a trivial problem because we need to consider the entire end-to-end -end behavior 
of all scheduling related entities at the same time. So uh, this actually motivates us to design a new real time scheduler for bus two. So uh, before introducing our new scheduler, uh, I will first explain more about bus two architecture as a background, especially what are scheduling related abstractions in ROS2 and what are the challenges from them. Now basically, uh, ROS2 consists of multiple abstraction layers and what we are interested in is fundamental uh, scheduling related entities across uh, those layers. Uh, so first, uh, there's a callback. Uh, the callback is a minimal schedulable entity in ROS2 and we modeled a real-time callbacks, either a timer or a regular callback based on whether it is triggered by a timer or external events. And callbacks are scheduled in a, a non-preemptive manner uh, within an executor. A node is a collection of callbacks and node is a, a minimum uh, allocation unit to executors. Then these nodes are allocated to an executor, which is an uh, OS level schedulable entity running on uh, CPU cores uh, like a thread. So executors are preemptible. Uh, in our work, we model the executor as a uh, thread. So we schedule executors with uh, SCAD 5.4, uh, which is a real-time scheduling policy in the Linux system. So on top of these uh, scheduling related uh, entity of ROS2, there is a chain. So uh, we define a chain model uh, as a set of callbacks uh, like here. So this model actually uh, has been widely used in prior work to analyze the end-to-end -end latency of tasks with data dependency. So we assume that the start callback is a timer callback and others are regular callback. And we also assume uh, that a chain has a semantic priority given by the system designer based on the criticality in the system. So uh, the scope of our uh, work here is how to schedule and allocate uh, schedulable entities to improve latency of chain. So with these scheduling entities, uh, what are challenges in ROS2? Uh, we first conducted a simple uh, experiment. Uh, we used a uh, two safety critical chain using uh, 10 callbacks here uh, and assumed that chain one is more critical than chain two. So here tau one and tau four are timer callbacks and they arrive at every one second. And all the other callbacks are regular callbacks and they are triggered by uh, its prior callbacks in the same chain. Uh, first, we perform the case uh, where all callbacks are in a single executor. So as discussed in the latest work, uh, ROS2 has a unique uh, scheduling uh, behavior within executor as a timer callback uh, always scheduled first. So uh, we also have observed this behavior in our uh, experiment. For example, uh, here, uh, tau4 and uh, tau1 uh, execute first whenever it is ready. Uh, this actually uh, makes the other regular callbacks priority ineffective. Therefore, as we can see in this table, a ROS2 results a fairness-based scheduling, which means that the uh, scheduler doesn't care about the criticality of chain, even if we actually assign the chain one is more critical. And this can jeopardize the timeliness of safety critical chain. So then this time, uh, we allocate callbacks of each chain to a separate executor. Actually, there is no general guideline to assign priority of executors uh, in ROS2. However, uh, in an intuitive way, we can allocate uh, all callbacks of chain one to the, to the highest priority executor because chain one is more uh, critical than chain two. Therefore, as we can see in this uh, scheduling figure, chain one always preempts chain two. However, this method does not resolve the problem because uh, in this case, chain two results unexpected high latency here. So this is mainly because for single chain, a uh, prior chain instance interferes other instances that were released later. This is like a so-called self-interference. So a priority assignment for executors is uh, another challenge in current ROS framework. 
So uh, we proposed a new real-time scheduling and analysis framework for MOS2. Uh, we called it uh, PICAS, which is a uh, priority-driven chain-aware scheduling. So the key idea is that uh, this approach uh, prioritizes a uh, critical computation chains across complex abstraction layers of ROS2 to minimize the end-to-end -end latency of critical chains. So uh, PICAS is uh, redesigned from ROS2 default scheduling to resolve uh, these uh, issues I've mentioned in the previous slides. Uh, basically, it has two goals. Uh, first, a critical chain execute uh, first uh, to avoid fairness-based scheduling. Uh, second, if we consider a, a single chain, a chain instances should be scheduled in their arrival order to prevent self-interference. So to achieve uh, these two goals, uh, PICAS framework uh, has a callback scheduling strategy within and across its queries. And uh, to realize this scheduling strategy, uh, PICAS is also equipped with callback priority assignment and chain aware node allocation algorithm. So uh, I will explain them for the next couple of slides. Uh, first, we proposed six callback scheduling strategy within and across executors. Uh, so the idea is that uh, for a single chain, uh, the priority of high indexed callback is higher than low indexed callback. So uh, we can guarantee the prior chain instance completes its execution before a newly released chain instance start execution. So for example, uh, if we say uh, there exists a newly released call, uh, a callback tau1 here, then it cannot start the execution until previous released tau4 here completes its execution because the priority of tau1 is lower than tau4. And if there exists multiple chains like here, uh, we assign higher priority to callbacks that are from more critical chains. So, uh, we also propose the strategy for change uh, running across executors in the bottom part here. Uh, we keep the same principle as the above, but uh, this time we assign executors priority to satisfy our uh, design goal. So uh, to realize uh, this scheduling strategy, uh, we uh, found solutions in uh, two aspects. Uh, first, a uh, priority assignment of callback, and second, uh, node allocation. A uh, priority assignment of callbacks can be done uh, intuitively uh, to realize the scheduling strategy. Uh, we first sort uh, change in an ascending order of the semantic priority, then assign priority to callbacks uh, from uh, low priority number to high. Then we also proposed a chain aware node allocation algorithm. Uh, basically, uh, this algorithm allocates given nodes to executors and then maps those executors to available CPU cores. Uh, this algorithm does not just simply allocate the scheduling entity. The main goal of this algorithm is uh, to minimize interference between chains by allocating all nodes to uh, associated to one chain uh, to the same CPU core whenever it is possible. So by doing so, uh, it can actually reduce the end-to-end -end latency of critical chains. So, so far, I explained the overall design of our uh, new scheduling framework. Uh, now, uh, we run the same workload set, uh, which has the two chains I've explained at the challenges slide previously. Uh, the first case is using a single executor, and the second case is two executors for uh, each chain. Uh, for both cases, we have observed the, the first chain, which is a more critical chain, uh, always executes first. So uh, we can say that PICAS does support priority-driven scheduling and not a fairness-based scheduling. And also, a uh, prior chain instance always completes its execution before newly released chain instance starts. So we also can say that the PICAS supports the chain aware scheduling. So uh, based on this result, uh, PICAS outperforms the ROS to default uh, scheduling significantly, especially in terms of the end-to-end -end latency, and also uh, overcomes the uh, aforementioned uh, challenges. 
Uh, TCAS also has equipped uh, end-to-end -end latency uh, analysis framework. Uh, latency analysis consists of uh, two steps. Uh, first, uh, computing uh, the worst case response time of each segment of a chain. Uh, here, a segment means that a uh, subset of a chain on one CPU core. Uh, then in the second step, uh, we can uh, add up uh, all segments' uh, worst case response time uh, for the same chain to get the entire latency. So the benefit of this analysis is that the analysis running time is significantly fast compared to the uh, latest watch through analysis. So here, as we can see, uh, uh, right bottom figure, uh, I actually tested the same workload set for watch to default and watch to PCAS. Uh, the green bar here uh, is analysis time of PCAS, and the yellow bar represents the latest uh, latency analysis technique for loss to default scheduler. So uh, PCAS analysis time is much faster than the latest analysis. Uh, so now with the evaluation, uh, we implemented PCAS scheduler in loss to uh, Elocon, and Foxy, and Galactic versions running on Ubuntu in uh, NVIDIA Javier NX, and also the Raspberry Pi 4 platform. And uh, we compared our PCAS to the uh, ROS2 default scheduler. Uh, in order to test uh, practical effectiveness, uh, we used a case study uh, that is inspired by indoor navigation stack of uh, F1 pen speaker here. Uh, as illustrated in, uh, in the bottom here, um, the workload for this case study uh, consists of six uh, real-time safety critical chain. And then uh, uh, we add another six best efforts chain. So uh, totally the 12 chains are running on four CPU core system. Uh, this figure shows uh, the maximum observed latency and the analyzed latency. Uh, here the y-axis means the uh, end-to-end latency. So uh, the lower is the better. Uh, here, the purple color here uh, represents the measured latency result of PCAS, and orange here, uh, bar, is measured latency for loss to default. So, as we can see, uh, PCAS outperforms the others on most real time chains. But uh, as the semantic priority of chain is getting low, what I mean is going to the uh, best effort chain. Uh, the latency of PCAS is not better than the others. And as you can see, even worse, uh, this result is actually what we have expected because PCAS can schedule change while respecting change semantic priorities. So uh, I conclude that this scheduler has a significant benefit in the end chain latency for safety critical chain. And here the green bar uh, demonstrate the result of PCAS latency analysis. So as we can see, the analysis uh, provides tighter upper bound for real-time chain, which means that PCAS is more practically uh, usable. Uh, so we also uh, integrate our PCAS framework into so-called uh, reference system. So reference system was developed by Apex AI for ROS2 executor benchmarking. And it was uh, first introduced in Roscon 2021 uh, real-time executor workshop. Uh, and we uh, we actually was uh, were invited to introduce our PCAS work to that workshop. So I integrated PCAS uh, to their reference system and evaluated on a Raspberry Pi 4 platform. Uh, this is the AutoWare uh, chain model uh, that the reference system provides with uh, several key performance indicators, such as the latency and number of dropped messages and jitters and, and so on. So here the red dot, uh, red dot represents the hot topic path, which is a LIDAR-based perception pipeline. So the end-to-end -end latency of hot uh, topic path is important, and that is the, one of the uh, key performance indicators for this system. So here, the bottom uh, left figure describes the average latency, uh, latency result of uh, that hot topic path. And as we can see, uh, 
Most PCAS with a, a single executor achieved up to 86% reduction in the latency compared to both to default single threaded executor. And the right uh, figure uh, shows the jitter of uh, behavior planner node, uh, which is a uh, blue color the node here. And the desired uh, timing behavior of this node is uh, as cyclic as possible. And we set the its frequency is uh, 100 milliseconds here. So therefore, uh, the lower jitter and drift are the better. So as we can see, loss to uh, PCAS outperforms loss to default in all combinations. Uh, therefore, uh, we conclude that uh, such a small uncertainty of our PCAS can improve the pre uh, predictability of uh, the loss to framework. So uh, although I did not include in this talk, we have uh, more evaluations like the schedulability analysis and managed learning time and so on. So, uh, if you are interested in, I think, uh, please uh, read, uh, read our paper. Um, so here's the conclusion. Uh, in this work, we actually proposed a new privacy-driven chain aware scheduler with its uh, end-to-end latency analysis framework. So our experimental results represent that uh, our proposed scheduler outperforms the existing lost scheduling with respect to the end-to-end -end latency under practical scenario. So, uh, but as a next step, uh, we are planning to uh, deploy our work to more complex and practical scenarios. And also we consider a problem of how to support uh, multi-threaded executor under our PCAS framework. So uh, these are our uh, PCAS sources and uh, uh, our PCAS framework integration to reference system source. Uh, we also opened the source code here and our paper is, um, you can uh, see, visit to read our paper. So uh, thank you for listening to uh, today's presentation. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer that. Yeah. Thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. Very, very impressive. And even more impressive is the paper. I encourage everyone to go and, and read it. I enjoyed it very, very much. I think uh, these folks go into a very complex topic into very details. Uh, and and uh, in my humble opinion, this is one of the best pieces I've, I've read so far. And I've been working on ROS2 real time for uh, for quite a while now. So uh, so kudos, Hang Young, and congrats mm -hmm. to you and, and to your team because I think this is this is very impressive. Maybe to kick to kick off the Q and A, I've got a, a quick question uh, regarding your uh, case study two, the reference system slide you you showed. Uh, mm -hmm. You you mentioned the fact that uh, Apexi disclosed reference system indeed. Uh, and uh, you showed a comparison between the default scheduler, sorry, the default executor in ROS2 and your PCAS uh, one. Um, can you comment on how does uh, your implementation compare to other executors? Because there are others available out there in the community. I think uh, Apex also has their own executor. Do you have any intuition on how it does perform in comparison to, to others out there? Um, actually, for the if we run the reference system, actually they uh, provide the, the, the key performance indicator results like the hot topic text latency and the behavior planners, the jitter, and the number of draft messages and so on. And so we actually create our PCAS framework to their reference system and compare it as the default uh, loss to execute. So on that workshop, actually, there's another teams from other um, the industry and the university, and they implement their own executors, as you can see. So they, they also uh, compared their own executor to loss to uh, default executor. So uh, we have a bunch of the uh, experimental results uh, uh, from that workshop. And so, yeah, I think the workshop, the, the, there's also the, um, the video record and the, 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 you can actually the revisit the, the workshop with the video. And so there will be more, uh, more information about the evaluation result and, and so on. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll check that out then. Thank, thank you. <laughs> more questions, guys and, and girls? So, so maybe I'll take another one then. <laughs> um, here is uh, so. So can you comment a bit more? And, and maybe I, I missed that. Um, but can you comment a bit more on on what performance uh, measurement mechanisms have you guys used to actually measure 
uh, latency. Uh, in particular, uh, I'm asking this because in the working group, we are using LTTNG, the Linux Tracing Toolkit Next Generation. Uh, and, and I see you're familiar with it. We're using that through uh, ROS2 tracing, which is the mm -hmm. uh, series of tools that integrated into uh, ROS2. And we've been, uh, at least I believe, we've been reasonably successful doing so because it allows us to trace, mm -hmm. uh, not only, sorry, trace, but also benchmark out of mm -hmm. uh, information that's generated while the system is running in a gray box manner. So we can mm -hmm. generate the actual data and then afterwards post-process it to generate the benchmarks, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, also LTTNG introduces a super super low um overhead so i was just curious can, can you comment slightly on on what have you used uh and how do you measure things oh, i see i see, I see. That's, a, that's a pretty good question actually for our own experiment we don't use LTTNG the tracing tools we actually the implement our own uh the tracing like that it's very simple like the, before the start the uh, uh execution of the callback we actually printed the, the time and the end of the latency, we uh, printed another uh, timer that printed. So actually, we just uh, simply uh, captured the end of the latency. So we didn't use the, any the special um, the tracing tools. And for this the reference system, they also use the similar approach like we did. So they don't use the, as far as I know, they don't use the LTTNG the tracing tools. But even if uh, on the workshop, they introduced a new tracing tools, real time tools, which is very great. But uh, for this uh, reference system and our evaluation, actually, um, we don't use the specific uh, tool at this time. Okay, okay, noted. And and, and just to check, I, I'm I'm guessing you're using essentially um, instrumentation, even if written in, in plain C++, that's non-blocking, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So on the source code, actually, we have some example, like how to um, the, capture the entire end -to latency. So yeah, there will be uh, uh, on the source code. We also provide uh, the analysis framework source code, and so yeah, that, that might be if you are interested, that might be helpful. Yeah, I, I am, I am, and and I'm following your work very closely. So I'm, I'm definitely yeah. reaching out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. More questions, folks? No. Okay, so uh, then I guess uh, once again, thank you for a fantastic presentation. This is this is a very very important topic, uh, and I, I fully agree with your uh, I think papers. And I and I am now quoting you guys. This hasn't received enough attention, <laughs> and there are uh, there are claims out there. You know that ROS two is real time, uh, similar to to security actually, but that requires people working towards that direction. Yeah. And I uh, I can only say that I think this work is is definitely inspiring uh, towards that. And it's also very connected to the uh, work we're leading here in the Hardware Acceleration Working Group, wherein at some point we'll uh, want to run uh, executors that not only uh, push uh, computations to CPUs, but eventually mm -hmm. also to, uh, to GPUs and to FPGAs. So we'll get there and hopefully we can cooperate uh, in the future mm -hmm. uh, towards that. Once again, thank you. And uh, everyone have a fantastic rest of your day uh, and uh, looking forward to see you all in the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Ciao.